Born in the middle of the Korean War, right around 1951 or 52. I have memories of that. I have memories of the fighting, and uh, I used to have nightmares about the war for many years afterwards. My birth father was a uh, American military man, and my mother was a, a Korean woman. And when I was four, uh, he disappeared. And I don't know why or how. So when I was four and a half, uh, my mother brought me to a street corner in a market and told me to look down the street one way and, and not turn around. And that was the last time I saw her. So I became a street orphan for a while until a um, Methodist missionary nurse found me and brought me to an orphanage. And I lived there for perhaps a year and a half before I was adopted into the U.S. by the Clement family. I uh, boarded an airplane when I was adopted. In 24 hours, no one could understand me and I could no longer understand any anyone else. So I thought overnight I had become very stupid. No one had explained to me that I was about to uh, embark on a journey to another country with a different language and different culture. And so uh, it was a, quite a surprise when I got off the airplane and listened to everyone speaking. The circumstances were that they, we were living uh, as a family in North Carolina and they notified us that several adopt adoptees would be arriving from Seoul by airplane in New York City. So I went up to New York City. There were several children with, their, they had Korean nannies with them to make sure that they were comfortable and they presented me to my son. I'm meeting my adopted dad for the first time and I don't know who he is. And so I've got my hand grasping uh, Mika's uh, clothing and she was the other adoptee that came there was only two of us that came on that flight so I'm holding on to her while I'm looking at him my adoptive father picked me up at the uh, New York airport and drove down to Car the North Carolina where we live and uh, they brought me into the living room and sat me down on this humongous couch uh, which is something I had never seen before. And one by one, they brought uh, my new brother and sister in, and they were sitting across the room from me, and they were uh, giggling and laughing and speaking this strange language, and I thought it was Chinese. We couldn't speak to each other, but I, the first words I ever said to him, and Tom remembers it, was we gave him a little toy Jeep, and then when I was driving in North Carolina to our home, and he kept moving the Jeep back and forth on the dash in front of me, and I kept saying, e easy, easy. <laughs> so his first word that he heard was easy. <laughs> um, I decided that I was not going to speak Korean anymore, and I had to learn English. And then uh, my parents invited some Korean students from the university over to talk to me in Korean, and I refused to talk to them. I ignored them. I hid behind my mother's skirt. 
because of experiences in Korea, he was afraid that they were going to bring him back. Very little could be determined about Tommy's life in Korea. After learning to speak English well enough to express himself, his memory of his life there began to fade and in fact became mixed with fancy. His life must have been uneventful and with few experiences. Food was scarce, blankets were few there, and he sleeps with all blankets tucked around and under his shoulders. My adopted mother's name was uh, June Clement, and uh, she was extremely uh, intelligent. Uh, she graduated from Smith College and always involved in helping somebody somewhere. And it, it was uh, more than just in our community. They, uh, they adopted when most people didn't. And they, most people were unaware of the Korean War. They didn't even know where Korea was. Uh, yet my mother, uh, she did part-time work for the UN and uh, uh, they had foresight and a huge humanitarian heart to, uh, see they had three biological children, but they still adopted internationally. If I ran into other kids who were prejudiced against me, I never came home and told my parents or family about it because they treated me so much like family that I didn't want to remind them that I was adopted. That's how completely they accepted me. The feeling of stupidity got worse when I went to uh, grade school. Well, I was put into first grade without knowing more than a couple of words of English. And uh, I didn't have a clue about school, what, what anybody was doing. Uh, for instance, in second grade, we were given a math test and I copied the little boy's paper next to me. His name was Christopher Vandenhoner. And the next day, the teacher handed out the papers uh, that were graded. And she said, here's an A plus for Christopher Vandenhoner. And here's another A plus for Christopher Vandenhoner. And then she looked at me and said, where's your paper, Tommy? And she knew that I had copied his whole paper, including his name. Even up through high school, he he was really behind. He didn't show scholastic aptitude. Mm -hmm. School didn't s seem like his uh, fort. But as he got into high school, we moved him into a technical program and he just thrived. We put him into an electronics program. And within a few months, the instructor was telling us that he had a real gift, that he was just a natural for it. I didn't talk very much, but I, did, I never stopped thinking. My mind was always going, my internal voice was always going. I just didn't share what I was thinking with people. He had all kinds of electronics, and particularly with electronics, he would bring home all kinds of electronic things and take them apart and put them together and, and conduct experiments in his room and flashing lights, and, and uh, had a, he had a marvelous time. Now, when I was around 20, um, uh, my mother passed away from uh, cancer, and uh, that was a very difficult thing for, for the whole family. Uh, my parents were right in the middle of designing a new house, a, a very large house. They had planned it for a long time, and uh, she, never, she never saw it completed. After my uh, mother passed away, my father he didn't want to keep working as an executive for General Electric because it had a lot of uh, pressure. And he moved to Indiana to open up stores. While he was opening up the stores, uh, I stopped going to school in Massachusetts and I transferred to Purdue because the university that I was going to had a 100% credit transfer back and forth to Purdue University. And that's how I ended up in Indiana. 
I, uh, I was in engineering school for a couple of years and then I got tired of that. So uh, I switched my degree to psychology, which was a big mistake. My, uh, my father said I shouldn't do that. He's an electrical engineer. He thought I should stick with the engineering program, but I really wasn't interested. So after I graduated with a psychology degree and didn't, I really couldn't get a job that paid very well, uh, I became a carpenter and I started building houses. And that was a, a very difficult job because, uh, well, in Indiana, there was a blizzard. It was, it's called the blizzard of 87. And on that day, we were outside putting siding onto a building and you could barely see the nail in front of you because it was, the blizzard was so heavy. And I remember one guy walking along, saw us and he came over to us and he wanted our phone number because he said, if you guys work in days like this, I know you'll show up to do my job. <laughs> then I got tired of that. Um, so I went back to engineering school and this time I completed my degree. And it's an electrical engineering degree from Purdue University. After the electronic job, I uh, obtained a uh, job as an inventor for a medical company. The company's name was Vantech. And if you are hired as an inventor for any company, um, they give you a dollar per patent. After they owed me uh, around six dollars, I decided in 1988 uh, to start my own company, and that's uh, Mector Laboratories Inc. It's been 24 years uh, of operating that company, and we're doing very well now. As a kid, my favorite show, my absolute most favorite show, was called Clyde Crash Cop. And Clyde Crash Cop was an inventor. He was tall and skinny, had a mustache, and whatever he drew on the chalkboard became 3D and in real life. So uh, after watching that show, I thought that's where I want to be when I grow up. I want to be an inventor. I want to draw things and have them come to real life. And oddly enough, uh, I grew up and I am an inventor. I have uh, 37 U.S. medical patents currently and uh, four pending right now. When I was around 12 years old, 13 or 14, um, the Beatles were very popular. And uh, so a lot of kids wanted to play guitar. Fortunately, in our neighborhood, we had four other kids that wanted to play guitar and, and they had their guitars and amplifiers so we formed a a, uh, a small band it was a lot of fun we practiced it at uh, down in basements at different people's houses that their parents didn't mind a lot of bad noise going on very loud i think that's why i've gotten back into it at, at a later age uh, i've joined a band and as you can see behind me uh, this is the equipment that we use. But hopefully, we're a little bit better than when I was 12 years old. I was a catcher for a trapeze. Uh, I played soccer for many years. I loved soccer. So I, I always stayed physically active. I, around when I was 27, I uh, enrolled in Taekwondo. And that was really interesting because that was the first time I was reintroduced to uh, the, uh, Korea again through Master Park. And, uh, and he spoke in Korean a lot. Uh, when we bowed in, uh, he'd say, Chayet Kinyet in Junbi, and then we'd fight. I had the opportunity to visit Korea for the first time in 1998. 
and I went with 27 other adoptees from all over the world. When we were flying into Korea, when I saw the land, I had a panic attack. It hit me just out of the blue, and I didn't know why. It must be that, you know, your physical being remembers everything. So, to me, uh, Korea meant the Korean War. But uh, the panic attack went away, and we landed, and uh, we were greeted by a, a large group of people. And I was simply amazed by what I saw, because this was perhaps uh, 50 years after the war. And my memories were Korea was flattened. And then 50 years later, Korea looked just like any modern city in the United States. It was pretty unbelievable that a country can rebuild itself to that magnitude in such a short time. Humans are amazing. And then I realized, after seeing South Korea and how prosperous South Korea is, that North Korea must be a, a totally different situation. I was watching uh, my favorite news channel, which is CNN, and they had a news program of uh, the devastation in North Korea from flood and famine. And they had pictures of um, some farmers that were trying to work on the flood uh, areas. And they, it looked like they had uh, shovels without the metal part of the shovel. They, they had sticks. So, but then it, in my mind, I think North Korea, they're both Koreans. They have an artificial boundary and this is a divided family situation. So uh, I wanted to go to North Korea. And the other thing was, I don't always believe what I see on the news. I'm a doubting Thomas. I have to see for myself. And so I went. And this was during a time when uh, uh, North Korea lost millions of people to starvation. And I uh, witnessed some of that myself. So it was important to me to um, bring uh, North Korea up to speed on surgery and surgical equipment. So uh, I uh, obtained a lot of equipment from different companies. When you're a president of a medical company, you tend to know other presidents of other medical companies. And um, they didn't hesitate a moment when I asked for equipment. They just shipped it to me. So I brought quite a bit of equipment in and I. Uh, lectured at the Pyongyang University Teaching Hospital, uh, their top surgeons. Um, and it, it was quite a rewarding experience. Um, it was late at night and we were going to a, uh, a restaurant. And uh, right next to the door was a five-year-old uh, orphan, homeless boy with no shoes on. And I thought, wow. That's my protege. So uh, it made me think, I thought, how in the world did I go from him to training surgeons and all the different events from that boy to where I was walking through, his image always stayed with me. On. Won Suk is a uh, famous Korean artist. The UN even made uh, stamps out of some of her images. She was involved in uh, humanitarian work with North Korea, and I traveled with her um, a couple of times to North Korea, and she was my interpreter, and that's how we first met. Well, through Wan Suk, I've uh, acquired a whole Korean family. All her, she has uh, seven siblings. There's two brothers and the rest are sisters. 
and then I constantly hear her speaking Korean to everybody, her friends and whatnot. So. Mm -hmm. Yo, yo. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He picked up a lot, uh, not only from me, I, I teach him some, but he picked up a lot um, watching Korean soap operas. I don't understand anything they're saying. So, Wansuk thinks it's funny when, uh, when we have it on and she's talking and I go, shh. We have to turn up the volume. Yeah, we have to turn up nice the volume that. more. And she thinks that's funny because I still can't understand what it is. He, he has this whole little booklet of a lot of phrases like, get out of here, I'm going crazy. Wow. You know, along with All nice right. things too. But. <laughs> yeah, Igaboya, Jugule, Moba. Well, those are gangsters, you know, before they get in a fight. And it, it's, it's funny about memory because uh, there's a sensory memory and I remembered kimchi and I remembered duck. But for all those years I had completely did, forgotten about them because they weren't around. So, but as soon as I tasted it, I thought, ah, oh, I remember this. And, I, and when you breathe out, you could smell it or you have the sense of it. So, brought back a lot of memories. The sister uh, was cleaning out uh, Thomas's uh, uh, parents' old home, and they came across this uh, document from an um, uh, adoption agency before the adoption. It had a few details of what he does, and he's very athletic, and also he loves to sing. And he can sing this uh, one uh, Santoki song. There, there's a couple of Korean songs that every Korean children sing. It's like, a, you know, Mary had a little lamb, you know, ring around the roses kind of song. And this particular song is about this mountain rabbit who goes around and looking for things to eat. The document said that he, he knows that and he sings it very well. So I asked him, do you remember what that song was? And he said, no, he doesn't remember anything. So I start singing, and we were kind of trying to go to sleep, and he wanted me to sing again. So I sang again, and he said, can you do it again and again? So I probably lined the bed, sang that song for about nine, ten times. In the Mountain Rabbit uh, song, it goes, Rabbit, rabbit, where are you going? And I'm going here to pick up chestnut. And then he said, rabbit, rabbit, where are you going? So it has odikayo, meaning where are you going? And he said that he remembered that phrase. He remembers saying that a lot. And, you know, of course, we immediately linked that a phrase with him missing his mother or his mother going away. I don't know whether that's connection, the abandonment thing, whether we're connecting afterwards or not, but all of that was just mixed in, and it was very emotional. I feel that my mother must have gone on in her life, and perhaps her new family has no idea about and I'm sure that's true to, to many uh, birth mothers. Uh, I hope that she's happy in her new family and that it, that's fine. I don't, I don't have any need to do that. I don't have any desire to do that and I will never do that. These are teardrops. And you can see in the teardrops the uh, center of the Korean flag. And then in here, in the teardrops, are uh, adoptee pictures. And what the, it symbolizes is the teardrops of the birth mothers that uh, gave up their children for adoption. 
That book was published right before I ever went back to Korea. But then at the same time, I was helping a lot of Korean adoptees work through problems. And, uh, you know, the suicide thing and alienation thing. Some of them have uh, a lot of self-doubt because they feel like they were rejected or abandoned. And it stays with them every day. And uh, they find that uh, very difficult to, to deal with. And, but it's like everything else. You can look at it from one position or another position. And, uh, you know, I look at it as, yes, you were abandoned, but you were also chosen. So, you know, this is weird, but adoptees are the chosen ones. What is a just man? And this man seems to be compassionate, good, and at the same time seems to be fulfilling his nature. Whatever that nature is, that could not be destroyed by his first uh, five years of experience. People get destroyed by that sort of beginning, but not this man. I don't know why uh, negative experiences can uh, affect different people differently. And uh, I have a lot of adoptee friends that are, are extremely negative about the whole adoption system. Um, losing their country, losing their language, uh, their customs, and then uh, ending up as a minority in a predominantly white society. Oh, and it's smooth. I was never <laughs> angry about my adoption. Uh, especially, uh, I noticed that a lot of the early uh, orphans from the war uh, were very glad to get, <laughs> get out of Korea. Korea was destroyed, it was flat, and everybody was hungry, it was so poor. And then all of a sudden, you fly into a country and there's no war, and there's all this food and play toys, and I mean, what's there to be angry about? Um, I had the opportunity to meet the uh, president of South Korea, and he was uh, saying to our group how ashamed he felt and sorry that uh, Korea sold their children uh, and I told him that I wish he didn't feel so badly because uh, and I really believe this uh, there is nothing in my past that I would change if I could you know your past makes you who you are today and uh, everything that you encounter is part of a learning experience going into the future seemingly with a fantastic disadvantage, and yet he made something more beautiful than most of us. So that's what I like about him. And I hope he understands how much uh, those of us who appreciate him see him as such, as a product of his own imagination. <laughs> this side is the American side, and this side is the Korean side. I think his generosity will continue, and, and, and the world benefits from having Thomas.